Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our first installment of Ask the Expert Nutrition Edition. My name is Wendy Beckman, and I am a registered dietitian with the New York State Office for the Aging and SNAP-Ed New York. Today, we will be talking about New Year's resolutions and goal setting for the new year. We will be focusing on improving nutrition and increasing physical activity because that is what me and my guests today are experts in. Joining me today, I have three nutrition professionals from the New York City Department for the Aging. Alyssa Dinzez is a registered dietitian and grant coordinator for the SNAP-Ed program at DIFTA. Tamar Elkin is a registered dietitian and nutrition educator. And Jalisa Cabrera is a nutrition educator with a bachelor's degree in nutrition. Thank you ladies for joining me today and hello. Hi, Wendy, thanks for having me. Hi. Thank you for having us. Hey everyone. So been, hey, Jalisa, how are you doing? Good, how are you guys? Excellent. We did receive some questions on the NYSOFA Facebook page for our experts, and we will be answering some of those questions. But first, I'd like to talk about the SNAP-Ed program in the New York City area. This program is funded by a grant from the United States Department of Agriculture and the New York State Office for Temporary and Disability Assistance. The goal of the program is to provide nutrition education for older adults in the New York City area. And I'd like to ask either Alyssa, Tamara, Jalisa, anyone who wants to jump in to tell us a little bit about what your SNAP-Ed program has been up to in the New York City area in the last few months. Because I know it's been a little bit of a change because of the pandemic. Sure, I'll take this one if you guys don't mind. Sure. Um, definitely we've had challenges having to adapt as everyone you know has recently. Um, Pre-pandemic, pre-COVID, we were out and about in the five boroughs going and delivering nutrition education to older adults. And we focus on things like eating healthy on a budget, making half your plates fruits and vegetables, eating whole grains, and learning about you know the importance of nutrition and physical activity together. Then with the pandemic, we kind of had to shift gears and take everything from home, working remotely. So we implemented our workshops uh, as conference calls. So this way, any older adult that didn't have access to the internet or wasn't so Zoom savvy, we, uh, we were able to have dial-ins. So we conducted our calls and we were able to reach so many adults, which was amazing. And again, around the five boroughs and then as of recently, we got approved to do Zoom classes. So now we are able to do our nutrition workshops on Zoom, which is so nice to be able to see people's faces again instead of just you know standing on the phone for an hour. So it's been so great and we've reached so many seniors that way as well. One of the benefits of doing it on Zoom is that you can also dial in. So if you don't have Zoom, you don't know how to use Zoom, there's also an ability to just call in just like the regular conference calls. So it's been really great. Challenging, but you know we're adapting and it's been really great. Yeah, I'll add, I'll add that just Jalisa and Tamar are rock stars. They awesome <laughs> providing, making this shift to providing workshops virtually has, you know, posed. It seems like once we get them up and running, it seems so easy, but it is challenging getting it up and running and all the nuances to figure out. So they've been really awesome at adapting. And um, I'd also like to add that we now since Jalisa came on board, we will be also offering our workshops in Spanish, where before we were only able to offer our workshops in English. Um, and especially in New York City, where we're located, we have a lot of Spanish speakers. So we're super excited to be able to offer these conference calls and workshops um, uh, in Spanish also. Yeah, I agree. I'm very excited that uh, Jalisa has joined your team in New York City. I think that's really going to be great. Um, and, and absolutely needed for your team. Um, and I know Tamara and Jalisa have been doing a lot of outreach uh, to the older adults in New York City, and you're gonna continue to do that. So I think that first we'll look at some of the questions that were uh, asked uh, from uh, the previous post on the Nice Sofa Facebook page. If anyone has a question, and we have gotten a few of them, um, you can also just any of our viewers can type them into the chat box and we'll do our best to answer those. But let's start with some of the uh, previously <clears throat> uh, provided questions. So the first one that actually was asked a couple of times was about older adults and getting them to drink enough fluids or more fluids. So um, <clears throat> I have a couple of ideas of, of some tactics that you can use for 
uh, drinking more fluids. I'll ask uh, my panelists, do you have any ideas? Does anybody want to add anything there? I can start if that's okay. Uh -huh. um, you know, older adults, something we hear all the time, and it is sci scientific. As we age, we lose our taste buds. So we tend to lose our thirst buds also, which come along with losing our taste buds. So sometimes I hear from people um, and from clients and from older adults that we work with that they literally don't feel thirsty all day. So it's important that even if you don't feel thirsty, you still need to drink plenty of water, even if you're not feeling thirsty. And sometimes as we get older, we need to sort of remind ourselves and keep track of, of that fluid intake. So something that I usually remind folks to do is kind of fill up like a bigger bottle of water that you know how many ounces of water is, is in it, like a big water bottle so that you can sort of keep track of how much fluid that you're drinking. Of course, um, if you have certain medical conditions like um, some uh, heart disease, some types of heart disease or kidney, chronic kidney disease, your doctor may suggest that you restrict your fluid intake. But for those of you that don't have a medical condition that would require you to restrict your fluid, you definitely want to make sure you get that good, like six to eight ounces, uh, six to eight glasses, sorry, um, per day of water um, and more if you take certain medications or if you're exercising a lot um, or if you're in hot, hot temperatures. But definitely one tip I provide to people all the time is keep that water bottle with you so you can see how much water you're drinking throughout the day. Yep. That's a great tip. Also, you know, like you said, um, to piggyback on something, right, that makes it a little bit easier to do. So if you take medication in the morning or medication yep. at night, add a cup of water to that and treat yep. it, you know, if it's hard for you to get water down, treat it like a medication, drink a glass, <laughs> of you take your pills, something like that. Right. So that you, know, you don't really have to go out of your way to do that. Right. I also right. just want to chime in and say, especially um, in the Latin community, we're big coffee drinkers. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, coffee can be dehydrating. So just remember what I like to do is um, take a glass of water before I have a cup of coffee, uh -huh. maybe about a half an hour afterwards, I have my, you know, cup of coffee, drink another glass as well. Um, because it can, you know, feel dehydrating. And, you know, when you're, it's, it's really cold outside. So you want to stay inside and be warm. You know, it's easy to have three to four cups of, you know, coffee with milk a day. And, and before you realize it, you know, you can feel really dehydrated. Right. You can flavor right. your water too, mm -hmm. um, to be able to enjoy it if you're really not a fan of drinking water. Um, and I know yeah. my mom really, it's a struggle. Um, she too is, you know, coffee, coffee, coffee all day. Um, so you can flavor your water with not just lemon and oranges. You can put cucumbers, you can put blueberries, you can put strawberries, pineapple, kind of squeeze it mm -hmm. in there. Let the water sit, it gets really flavorful that way. Some water bottles and actually one of the items um, that we were able to give out during some of our workshops is a water bottle that has a diffuser in it where you yes. can put the fruit inside the little sack or the little diffuser and it helps to flavor mm -hmm. the water. I find that to be really palatable. Yep. And I like to, I mean, one of the things that I like to do is to use seltzer water. So with a little bit of juice in it. So a can of seltzer water with about four ounces of juice in it, um, really adds some flavor to that water. And then it feels to me more like soda with a lot less sugar, right? So there's probably about nine, eight, nine teaspoons of sugar in a regular soda. And by adding a little juice to a seltzer, a flavored seltzer or a plain seltzer, it feels like soda, but it's got a lot less sugar in it. So that's um, something, you know, again, that would be a way to get water without, if you really don't like water, um, or you could even make like a slushy with some frozen fruit and some water, put it in a blender. And, um, you know, you're going to be getting some nutrients in there with some vitamins and minerals and some fiber with your water. And it's not going to really taste like water. So those are all good ideas. Um, I know one of the other questions was asking about individuals who have dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Sometimes it's really quite difficult to get them to drink enough. Those individuals are going to need more verbal cues from their caregivers to drink. Um, also, there are three things that some people might not realize, but they count as fluid because they melt when they hit your stomach. So jello counts as fluid, popsicles count as fluid, and ice cream counts as fluid. So for some individuals who maybe have some memory problems and maybe they aren't eating as well as they used to, if they like ice cream, you know that you're also, you're giving them some nutrition, they have some protein, there's some, uh, you know, uh, 
create, you know, for milk, it's a milk product, a dairy product, um, but it also does count as fluid. So a four ounce portion of ice cream counts as four ounces of fluid, which I always think that that's, that's like good news, right? Or a milkshake, you can give someone a milkshake um, in that sort of a situation. Um, there are also vegetables that are full of water, right? Like uh, cucumbers, peppers. Yep. So those are sources of hydration as well. Right, right. And those, those things absolutely are going to help in that way. But one of the things to remember is that in the fluid recommendations, you know, they say approximately six to eight cups of water or fluid a day. Um, your food intake is included in that recommendation. So if you don't like to drink, you can't just rely on things like watermelon or other really juicy foods. I'm not saying not to eat them. I'm just saying that you have to have some fluid above and beyond that uh, to, to meet your fluid needs. So I know that can be challenging sometimes, especially this time of year, you don't feel hot, you're not sweaty, but the air is very dry. So it is still important, you know, to, to drink as much. Well, let's move on to, we had two questions, you know, one was about uh, diabetic meals and insulin resistance. So type two diabetes is insulin resistance. So sometimes it's called type two diabetes, sometimes it's called ins insulin resistance. Um, and it's so hard to make recommendations for meals because everybody likes different things and I, everybody has different cultures and they come from different backgrounds. So I, I wouldn't really give you like food recommendations per se, but if you are someone who has type two diabetes, what you want to watch is your carbohydrate intake. So carbohydrates are anything that's starchy like pota potatoes, pasta, those types of things or sweet. So anything that has got refined sugar in it specifically. Um, fruit does have some naturally occurring sugar in it, but you don't have to worry about that as much because there's fiber in the uh, fruit that will help with that. So there's, you're gonna wanna limit your portion sizes of uh, your carbohydrates. Um, so be mindful that if you're going to have some rice, don't have three cups of rice, you're going to have a third of a cup of rice because that's what a serving size is. And most, most of the time you can look up on the internet what a serving size is. Um, and a way to sort of limit your carbohydrate intake is to eat more fruits and vegetables. So one of the things that our SNAP educators recommend a lot is to make half your plate fruits and vegetables. So if you imagine a plate, half of it is, <clears throat> excuse me, fruits and vegetables, and then a quarter of it is a protein source and a quarter of it is starch. So if you fill half of that plate with fruits and vegetables, you're automatically going to be cutting down on your other portions of food. Um, one of the things that I do is I get my vegetables first and I put those on my plate, fill my plate up with my vegetables, and then there's less room on my plate for other things <laughs> that maybe I shouldn't have as much of. So that's uh, one of the things that I'd like to do. And uh, certainly, uh, does anybody else have any ideas? One thing um, I, I like to recommend too is for clients is really getting out there if they're able to get out there and do some form of exercise because exercise really helps to burn calories. It really helps to burn those carbohydrates um, and it really gets our metabolisms um, going in addition to being really good for our heart. But for folks with type two diabetes or for anyone just for general health to really get moving. And that's something that we yes. also recommend during that's our workshops is to really get moving. Um, and I know that, you know, maybe this overlaps with another question that we have about being stuck home during COVID and how do we get outside and exercise? And I know my uh, lovely other panelists had some great ideas when we were talking earlier about ways to exercise, but something I always recommend to clients, if you're able to just get outside and walk. Walking is one of the greatest forms of exercise. You don't need fancy equipment. You don't need a gym to do it. As long as it's not, you know, um, horrible weather outside or icy or rainy or snowy, uh, you can just get outside and walk. You don't have to be a marathon walker. You don't have to power walk. Um, and fresh air does wonderful things for our mind, our mind as well. So just get outside, get outside and walk. And one more thing um, just about the type two diabetes is oftentimes we see that folks who, um, who have type two diabetes are also overweight. And so um, losing some weight can also help with the type two diabetes. Yes, yep. it can help with insulin resistance. Yes, that is absolutely correct. 
So, okay. So we had someone who asked previously about information on how to getting help with signing up for SNAP. Um, and uh, that is actually not something that our program does with SNAP-Ed. However, we do have some information um, that we can put in the chat box um, <clears throat> of a, an organization. It's called Hunger Solutions New York. And uh, the website for that, we'll put that in the chat box. Um, or you can uh, just search for that on the internet, Hunger Solutions New York. Um, and those individuals can help uh, if you need any help with uh, signing up for SNAP. Uh, additionally, you can also uh, contact your local office for aging because they also have individuals who can help you with the SNAP ad um, process and signing up for SNAP. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, we had one comment uh, previously uh, where individual was talking about uh, letting older adults sort of eat whatever they want. Um, and I do agree with that with some caveats. So it depends on the person. So just as there is a big difference between a one-year-old and a 30-year-old, there's a big difference between a 60-year-old and a 90-year-old. And it depends on the person's um, medical conditions. Do they have any, um, do they have a chronic disease or a, a disease that is uh, continuing and it's, it's not going to lengthen their life and things like that? You know, in that situation, maybe the person should be able to just eat whatever they want. Um, someone who's in their 60s and who is in good health, I wouldn't tell them to just eat whatever they want. I would say that they would benefit from a, uh, a balanced diet and exercising regularly. So um, do my other panelists have any thoughts on that? I, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, that's great. So let's see, what else do I have going on here in the chat box? So yeah, I know that we, so again, one of the previous questions was um, having difficulty getting outside to exercise. And Alyssa uh, talked a little bit about being able to go out and walk. Um, but what about some ideas for exercising inside, even if you have limited space? Sure. One of the things I recommend is, uh, Jaleesa is doing it, right? Move. Put on the radio, put on your record player, put on CDs, whatever you can. Get some music going and, you know, that gets your blood flowing. If you're washing dishes or cleaning the floor or, you know, anything to keep moving. And then, you know, have fun while you're doing it. Makes it a little easier. Okay. All right, great. Um, I think that also uh, on YouTube, so if you have internet access, you can search on YouTube. They do have some exercise videos for uh, limited space that are made specifically for individuals who are in an apartment who don't have a lot of floor space. Um, so that is something that you can search for on YouTube. Um, Julissa, Another option also, oh, sorry, Wendy, is go ahead. if you live in an apartment building, you take the stairs right? It's a good way to get a little cardio in, go up, go down. Yep. You don't have to go outside, especially if it's cold or if it's raining. It's right. something easy to do while you stay indoors. Yep, I agree. Right. And also um, check your local um, television listing. Sometimes early in the morning, PBS or, you know, um, maybe Channel 21, they also offer, you know, free um, exercise programming. So it might be a little bit early, but, you know, um, why not? <laughs> right, right. I actually, I am one of those people, I have tried exercising at all different kinds of, all different times of the day. And I have come to the conclusion that what works best for me is to do it first thing in the morning. Right. And that means I have to get up earlier and I don't like that. But uh, it's really one of the only ways that I'm able to consistently get enough exercise in because I get up in the morning, I get it out of the way, and then I don't have any more excuses. <laughs> you right. know, in, in, in the evening, sometimes when I come home, I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that, or something happened and I was running late or whatever. So uh, I recommend that. Uh, and take sometimes. note of your energy levels throughout the day. I notice I have more energy there in the morning. I'm more of an early bird, whereas mm -hmm. my body starts crashing around 3, 4 p.m. Yep. And um, 
I'm not going to do anything besides, you know, start prepping <laughs> for dinner and then I am right. done after that. Yeah. <laughs> right, so, right. And, yeah. and some people who are maybe night owls, then they exactly. would probably be better exercising later in the day after dinner. So, you know, everybody's different and you have to find out sort of what's right for you. Right. I have a question from Barb that says, what are proper portion sizes? I am a big fan of the, the portion sizes that you can use your hand for, or, um, you know, a computer mouse is, you know, half of a cup about. So um, you can look on, up for those uh, types of things um, on the internet. Um, there are, you know, it depends on what food item you're talking about. So for example, protein, a serving size is three ounces, which is about the size of the palm of your hand or about the size of a deck of cards with height length. So um, sometimes like the chicken breasts that you get at the grocery store, they're gigantic, right? They're, they're probably like two decks of cards, maybe three from the giant mutant chickens. I don't know where they get them from. So. <laughs> Uh, right? They're huge, right? So I, usually with those things, I cut them in half or sometimes in thirds. So because really a, a lot of the food items that we get from restaurants and things like that are big. They're more than a portion size. So um, those are things that you can look up online uh, just because uh, I, I, unfortunately, I can't go over what all the portion sizes of all of the foods are, but, and they do vary. So um, a half a cup of pasta is a serving, but a third of a cup of rice is a serving. And those are both carbohydrate foods. So you do have to look them up. So, but a lot of that information is online. Um, Wendy, something I'll add is I, um, the, yeah. what you had said, sort of like the visual method is really great. Yeah. But what I often do is I encourage clients to first to measure it out one time, yeah. just to see what it really looks like on the plate, because you'd be pretty surprised. And I sort of, yeah. sometimes once in a while, I have to check myself because you, you yeah. sort of lose <laughs> track with all these, these big portion sizes these days, you kind of really lose track of what really is a portion size. So once in a while, I'll actually go and measure out that half a cup. And you're like, wow, that's all, um, it right. looks like such a small, now everyone does need different portion, different numbers of serving. So just because the serving size of, of uh, protein is three ounces, it doesn't mean that everyone only needs three ounces of protein at one right. time, depending on your, you know, various things, but it is a good idea, you know, at least one time to sort of measure it out and see what it looks like on your plate. And then you can, uh, be able to visualize a little bit easier moving forward. Right, right. And myplate.gov is a really great place to go uh, website. Uh, and you can put in your information of your height and your weight and your gender and how active you are. And it will give you a meal plan and about how many servings of different types of foods that you need every day. So that's an excellent um, resource, um, myplate.gov. And we can probably put that in the chat box as well. Um, how can my mother and grandmother manage their cholesterol with diet, some foods to eat and some foods to avoid? Who wants to talk about that one? I'll start first with fiber. Fiber is a great way to help naturally lower cholesterol. It, you know, it has a lot of benefits fiber. One of them is that it kind of acts like a sponge by going around and collecting the extra LDL, right? The bad cholesterol, and it pulls it with it on its way out, right? We also know one of the benefits of fiber is that it helps us go to the bathroom regularly. Nobody likes to talk about it, but it is important. So, you know, keeping that in mind that when you eat foods that are rich in fiber, it'll keep you regular and it'll also help naturally lower cholesterol. Another thing um, to help cholesterol, we always think that, you know, fats are bad, but all fats are really not created equally. Um, so those healthy fats like avocado and things that are high in omega-3 fatty acids are really helpful for our cholesterol. We do need fat in our diets. We just need the right kinds of fats. So um, fatty fish, avocado, olive oil, um, olive oil ground flaxseed. I recommend ground flaxseed all the time because it has not only healthy fat, but it also has fiber like tomorrow just was talking about. So those healthy fats are really important. Right. And just to, oh, sorry, Wendy. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jalisa. Just to add on to what Tamar was saying. So um, making sure that your grains that you're eating are whole grains, right? So you can get all of that fiber, oatmeal, um, you know, brown rice, whole wheat pasta, you know, of course, you know, with the addition of, of vegetables, but 
definitely making your grains whole as yep. much as you can. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And so really the, one of the things that I try to remember is that saturated fats will actually uh, increase the bad cholesterol, which is the LDL cholesterol. Um, so uh, saturated fats <clears throat> in general are solid at room temperature. So when uh, Elisa was talking about the healthy fats, those are generally, those are poly and monounsaturated fats, and those are generally liquid at room temperature. So think of olive oil, canola oil, those types of things. And saturated fats are solid at room temperature, things like butter, mostly saturated fat, um, you know, on a steak, if you buy uh, or a piece of beef or a piece of pork and there's the white fat on the outside of it, that is solid at room temperature. You should cut that off. The skin on chicken and turkey is mostly saturated fat. It's solid, solid at room temperature. Remove those things from your foods um, and try to eat a lower fat diet. And that can help uh, to reduce your cholesterol, your blood cholesterol. Um, exercise, yep. Exercise can help increase the good cholesterol, which is HDL and lower the bad cholesterol, which is LDL. Um, and unfortunately, many times, uh, high cholesterol is the result of genetics. So I myself have bad cholesterol genes. My father and my everyone on my father's side of my family have had uh, poor cholesterol. And unfortunately, I inherited that. So even though I eat a fairly low fat diet and I try to exercise regularly, I struggle with my cholesterol. So in some cases, you do need the help of a doctor um, and you do need medication. So um, I'm sure at some point I will have to go on some medication for that. Um, the SNAP income guidelines, unfortunately, we can't give you that, but the information uh, for uh, Hunger Solutions New York, uh, which I believe they put in the, the chat box, uh, you can look for their website and they can give you information on uh, income guidelines for SNAP and how, help on how to sign up. Uh, what to do if my dentures don't fit properly and I have trouble chewing, so it makes it hard to eat fruits and vegetables. So this, yeah, I will let you uh, talk about that, Alyssa. Um, sometimes uh -huh. de uh, de dentures misfitting are due to weight loss. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I was yeah, going to say, so. the first thing I would do if you have the opportunity is to go back to your dentist or your doctor and have yes. them try <laughs> to refit you for better dentures rather than just putting up with it or dealing with it. If you have that opportunity, right. that is the first thing that I would do. But I would also think about, you know, fruits and vegetables, which ones, not that we want to overcook them to the point where they just become mushy, but what things could all, could always be, could be mushed up, like a cauliflower rice or mashed cauliflower um, instead of mashed potatoes. You can make that and you can make it a little bit softer. You can add um, a little bit of butter or a little bit of cream to it to sort of, to, to puree it up a little bit. Um, some mm -hmm. fruits can be cooked, like stewed apples are delicious and stewed pears. So you can cook mm -hmm. them, which make them a little bit softer. So I would try to focus on those fruits and vegetables that can be cooked a little bit softer or prepared a little yep. bit softer yep. naturally, rather than going straight to thinking that you just need to puree all of your foods because right. that's just simply not true. Um, you can make some of your food softer to begin with. Right, right. That's, so that's a good a option also helps, you know, naturally cook and, you know, soften a lot of the vegetables that you add to it. And it's a good way to get in a lot of extra vegetables that will be soft. Yep. Yep. I agree. Uh, what is everyone's healthy favorite favorite healthy snack? That is a great question. Mm. Ah. Here that I, I could share. I, I love um, and you know I don't know that we're allowed to do this. I it's not brand specific, but I happen to love Kind Bars. Um, they're one of my favorite healthy snacks. Um, mainly, and what's in them? It's there's some dark chocolate, so I tend to really like dark chocolate. It has a small amount of dark chocolate, and there's a lot of nuts in there. Um, to me, they're really satisfying. It, there's um, a limited amount of ingredients. So something I'd always look for in a snack is the less mm. ingredients, the better, and rather than choosing those snack foods or snack bars that have tons of ingredients. So you want to choose things that are less processed. So that's one of my favorite snacks. I happen to be eating it before today's workshop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 one of my favorite snacks is apples and peanut butter, especially this time of year. I, I'm actually, I, I live in upstate New York um, and uh, we are in apple country and I just love it when we, it's time for the fresh apples in September. Um, and even into this time of year, we can still get 
our local apples. So, uh, you know, anything uh, that is, uh, can, can be grab and go. I really like uh, this time of year also, some things that are uh, in season are those little clementine oranges. I love those. Um, a lot of times they have them on sale. Um, so I like to pick those up when they're on sale. Uh, and then I try to prepare the, the fruits and the vegetables, whether it's carrot sticks or um, peppers. I love to cut up peppers and have those. Um, you know, I try to wash them ahead of time. So sort of one of the ways that I try to get myself to myself to eat more fruits and vegetables is to have them ready. So, uh, you know, on the, if I shop on the weekend, I get them out and I prepare, wash them all up and prepare them uh, and put them in the fridge so that they're easy to, to get to. Um, and, you know, just as easy as grabbing a bag of chips, right? I can, I can grab an apple actually easier than I can grab a bag of chips because I have to reach on top of the refrigerator and get that. So, uh, <laughs> you know, certain things like that, uh, try to eat those types of things as much as I can. Anybody else? If you have a little bit more time, I love kind bars. I also love apples and peanut butter. Um, if you yeah. have a little bit more time, I like to buy my own um, kernels, corn kernels. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just put a tiny bit in a pot of oil. Um, you know, I usually use canola oil. Um, you put a handful of kernels, set the lid. You're going to start hearing it pop. Um, and then I just usually make my own kind of popcorn trail mix. So I'll have, uh -huh. you know, maybe some dark chocolate, um, mini chips, um, or some cashews or almonds, bunch it up. Um, and if you like it a little bit more moist, you can drizzle a tiny bit of olive oil mm. and, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll curl up with Netflix and, and my popcorn. Ah, <laughs> uh, popcorn. Popcorn is a whole grain. Exactly. So that's a, right. It's a great way to make half your grains whole grains and uh, get more whole grains uh, just with your snack. I, I can't believe I forgot about that, Jalisa. <laughs> uh, let's My see. My favorite snack is yeah. cottage cheese. Mm. I know that one gets a lot of eye rolls sometimes. Not <laughs> no. texture. I love cottage <laughs> cheese. <laughs> so I like cottage cheese. I'll cut up some peppers also, Wendy, like you said, yeah. or like yep. whole grain crackers, something crunchy because it's kind of yep. Yep. like a mushy, softer texture. So I yep. like that crunch with a good cottage cheese. Yeah. That well, knock until you really try good. it. I know it's not everyone's right. favorite snack. <laughs> I, I happen to love cottage cheese. And, uh, you know, I think it's, again, look for the lower fat options. So look for 1% uh, or less. So when you're looking for dairy, uh, try to find low fat or no fat options of dairy. And that includes things like cottage cheese. Uh, so that is excellent. Um, one of the good things about cottage cheese, it has a little bit of protein in it and protein helps you to feel full longer. Also, any kind of snack that has fiber in it, like fruits and vegetables, um, is going to help you feel full longer. So if you're eating that snack, try to sort of tide you over till your next meal time. Um, anything with protein or fiber in it is going to help you sort of, uh, you know, make it to your next meal. Uh, it can help with uh, people who are insulin resistant. Help, it can help with uh, blood sugar control too. So that's all, always a nice thing. Also calcium and vitamin D. Right, calcium and vitamin D in your, in your dairy products. That's excellent. Um, let's see. Should everyone take a multivitamin or any other supplements that we should be taking? So I will tell you that um, as someone who is aging, and we all are aging, we start aging the moment that we, we arrive on this planet, but um, I can tell you that especially people in the Northeast, we tend to be vitamin D deficient uh, because the angle of the sun in the sky in our hemisphere is at too low of an angle for like six to nine months out of the year to convert vitamin D in our skin. So, as we age in particular, and if we're especially spending more time indoors, most individuals in the Northeast need a vitamin D supplement. So um, you can get your vitamin D through a multivitamin. So um, I think especially, you know, if you eat a, a balanced diet and you have lots of fruits and vegetables in your diet, it, it's probably, pretty good bet that you are um, 
doing all the right things to get the vitamins and minerals that your body needs, but it's, it's hard to get enough vitamin D. So uh, taking a multivitamin sometimes can be a good idea and possibly vitamin D supplements if you need to. Again, you're going to want to go see your doctor uh, regarding that. Uh, and uh, my doctor is pretty good. She, she tests the vitamin D pretty regularly to make sure I'm on the right track. Anybody else have any ideas regarding? Yeah, go ahead. Wendy, I was just going to piggyback on what you said about vitamin D and, and you started to say about your doctor um, that you, vitamin D is oftentimes now part of your regular checkup, yep. um, part of your regular physical. They actually test your levels of vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend that you ask your doctor if they're not already testing it to ask them yes. to test it. Um, there also has been some research being conducted with vitamin D and immune systems and with mm. COVID, the importance of having adequate vitamin D, especially now during COVID. There's some research being done uh, on okay. how uh, adequate vitamin D levels could help to keep a strong immune system. Wow, that's really great. Yeah, go ahead, Tamar. I just want to also advise, right, that we shouldn't be taking supplements um, on our own without getting them, you know, checked. It's not always a very regulated industry. So, you know, before you just run over to a pharmacy and start, you know, taking everything off the shelves and self-administering, I would talk to a registered dietitian, talk to your physician, you know, get a little bit more guidance in if you need a supplement and which one to be taking um, instead of, you know, trying to go down that path alone. Right, right. Tamar, would you agree that a multivitamin probably is something you could take on your own without too much? Yeah, multivitamins, the levels of them are usually lower so that like, you know, you put in a little bit of effort too with a healthy diet, right? So that plus the vitamin would equal like a good baseline. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of more of like a catch-all, right? Maybe today you didn't get enough of your dark leafy greens. So, you know, taking that multivitamin will help provide a little bit more. But, um, you know, that in general, probably yes. But uh, anything beyond that, I really would advise, you know, getting getting an extra set of eyes on that. Yep, yep. Okay, good. And we have a question about coconut oil. Coconut oil, good or bad? I'm going to say, right, is it a healthy fat? Or is it a not healthy fat? Who wants to answer that one? <laughs> I'll answer it. <laughs> so co coconut oil is, is it solid at room temperature or liquid at room temperature? Solid. It is solid. solid at room temperature. So it is a saturated fat. So even though it is from a plant source, I believe it's actually, and someone will probably correct me on this, but I believe it's the only plant oil that is a saturated fat or is mostly saturated fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, right. So um, I, you know, I believe that it's going to, uh, because it's a saturated fat, it is going to have the same health effects as eating butter, right? So butter in moderation is okay, but you don't want to eat it every day and you don't want to eat tons and tons of it. So um, I would say the same thing about coconut oil. Um, I actually feel like it's more beneficial to melt it down and put it on your hair <laughs> than it is to eat it. <laughs> I think there's some, you know, people may have heard about some of these like quacky diets out there where people are putting coconut oil or, um, coconut oil in their coffee, I think, or right. something yes. like that for, for health. So maybe that's where coconut oil has been getting a lot of attention. Yeah. 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 But it, you know, it, it's really, it's like butter, you know? So I, I've, I've heard of people putting butter in their coffee also. I'm, I'm not, I don't understand that. Jalisa, I know that you said that you like to drink coffee. I'm actually not a coffee drinker. So um, when some, I heard people were putting butter in their coffee, I was like, oh, double oo, right? Like, yeah. I don't, <laughs> not my thing. <laughs> Along the lines of those high fat, low carb diets. Um, okay. That, you know, again, like, you know, Tamar is saying, you know, you have to just be careful with a lot of these fad diets and a lot of trendy diets, because again, you know, you don't know you know, especially if you're not going to the doctor and not getting your physical and your blood results, you don't know if you're high in cholesterol and then you're going to start consuming, you know, uh, high saturated fat diets, you know, you don't know what effect that's going to have on your body. So, you know, of course, always talking to your doctor, making sure you're getting your blood, you know, your, your blood checked out and, you know, your triglycerides and making sure you ask for those results is always, yeah. is always a good way to start. 
you know, but um, yeah, uh, just stick to whole fruits and vegetables and, you know, <laughs> um, whole grains, clean protein, you know, you should you'll be okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> One of the things I think with coconut oil is that it has a high smoke point. So I think uh -huh. um, oh. people like it for that. But um, mm -hmm. in terms of saturated fat, I would recommend something like an avocado oil, which also has a really high smoke. Right, point. right, right. Yeah. Right. So for cooking, right, right, right. So uh, when referring to smoke point, uh, what uh, Tamara is talking about is if you put something in a pan, um, how quickly does it start burning? So butter has a pretty low smoke point. So it, right, you can, I, I do it quite frequently, right? I put some butter in a pan and I walk away because I get distracted by something and then the butter is burning uh, and the smoke alarms are going off in my house. So, uh, you know, butter has a fairly low smoke point. Um, other fats and oils have a higher smoke point so they can be good for um, cooking um, and they can be good for things like frying. We don't always recommend frying because uh, it can uh, add fat to items that didn't have fat in them before. So it can be increasing the calories of something uh, sort of unnecessarily. So, uh, but when, if you are going to fry something, you need to look for an oil with a high smoke point so that you don't like, you know, everyone's seen the pictures of people who caught their house on fire, um, frying a turkey at Thanksgiving. So we are, we are beyond that point in time of the year, but um, that can happen. <laughs> that is why it happens. So <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to think. I don't see I have anything else in there. I, I know that we... Um, we talked a little bit about sort of fad diets and, you know, this time of year when people are making uh, some New Year's resolutions, maybe to eat healthier and to exercise more, I think that sometimes people are tempted to try sort of fad diets. Um, do any of you have, you know, any more to say about that type of thing? Start just by saying that in the long run, just from my experience, in the long run, fad diets really don't work. You may see very quick results and you may see um, with very low carbohydrate diets, for example, you may see very quick results. But um, when we tend to look at those clients one year, two years, three years down the line, um, we often don't see any different results than we would with um, either a healthy, just a regular healthy diet, or we see that they went back to their pre-fad uh, diet weight to begin with. So anything that, any diet that guarantees you to lose quick weight, anything more than two pounds a week is really, would, I would steer clear of that. Right, right. Because putting weight on takes time. So taking the weight off also do, also takes time as well. And I try to think of it sort of as, well, your, your body has to adjust to this lower weight and it takes time to do that. Um, and some fad diets, to your point, Alyssa, is they, can't, they might be very restrictive and it's not sustainable. So when we're talking about uh, eating healthfully, it's something that you wanna do for life. You wanna make changes slowly over time so that you can maintain those changes for your lifetime, not just for a few weeks or a few months and then lose the weight. And then you go back to the way you were eating before and guess what? the pounds are going to come right back on again. So slow and steady weight loss is better. What about you, Tamara, Jalisa? What do you feel about that? Yeah, I was going to go with that, you know, with the idea of any diet, you know, diet that cuts out an entire food group, right? Yes. Oh, yep. that's it. No fat, right? And then, you know, no next carbs. your cousin's <laughs> birthday and someone brings cupcakes and, you know, you haven't had fat or a carb in a whole week. And then, you know, all it takes is that one whiff of frosting and you go nuts, right? And you'll eat five or six cupcakes where if you weren't so overly restricted, right? And you kind of worked in, you know, having a treat here and there and trying to increase your vegetables and, you know, choosing leaner sources of protein, making lifestyle changes like that, as opposed to being so restrictive that really will end up causing you to binge. And like, you know, Elisa was saying before, you could end up at a heavier weight than you were before all the restrictions. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I agree. Yeah, with that, just piggyback on everyone, you know, what you guys have been saying, I, I agree, you know, everything in moderation, 
um, to prevent that binging, especially, you know, with the new year and the new year resolutions, we all might have, you know, a lot of folks, it's hard for, you know, to keep up these unrealistic expectations. And, right. you know, you don't want to binge come around February, Valentine's Day, and you're eating a whole, you know, huge heart of chocolate, you know, <laughs> whereas if you, if you understand it's okay, everything in moderation, you know, it's okay to have chocolate or it's okay right. to have two squares of chocolate, you know, right, right, right. I think that binging is important. Right, right. And portion control. So, yeah. so much of it is like portion sizes and portion control. There was a question earlier about portion control. And one of the ways to find out what a portion is, is if you're a pack, if it's a packaged food, let's say it's a box of Cheerios, you can look on the package and it'll tell you what the serving size is for that. And I forgot that's an easy way to find out what that serving size is. And then as Alyssa said, then measure that cup out. And what does that cup look like in my regular cereal bowl? Right. I, I happen to have really big bowls. I don't particularly like them, but they came with the set of dishes that I have. And so then I put a cup of cereal in there and sort of like not very much in the bowl, but that's, it, it's good to know what your dishes look like right. with those particular servings on them. That's always a good thing to do. You know, you, you can a use a different bowl. So when that happens, I know, I know. it sort of becomes I, I, like <laughs> frustrating that you now met out know. and you're like, Ooh, this is all I can eat. Uh, I yes. just recommend use a smaller plate, use a smaller bowl. Sometimes yes. I eat on a salad plate because yep. depending on what it is that I'm eating, I know that's the right amount of food where if I put that same amount of food on a big plate, I'm going to be depressed because I'm going to look yes. like and say, this yeah. is all I get to eat. When it comes to, to vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, you don't need to measure those out. Right. I would say the Load more them up. You know, the more the merrier, fill up that plate with as much as you want to eat of the non-starchy vegetables. Um, and if you're still hungry after you've eaten your food, load up more non-starchy vegetables. I don't right, think, right. you know, as dietitians, you can, you can see, let me know if you concur, but I don't know that we've ever heard of someone gaining weight or not able to lose weight because they've eaten too many non-starchy vegetables. Right, right. So. <laughs> the vegetables, right? So the vegetables, the, the trick with the vegetables is don't load them up with butter or cream sauce. Right. So choose your vegetables that are plain. So you can use canned vegetables, you can use frozen, you can use, dr you know, dried canned frozen, they all count. Um, but you want to if you're choosing frozen, you want to look for things that don't have added cream sauces, um, or butter sauces on them, because those are going to add extra fat and calories that you don't need. Um, and if you're looking for canned, look for low sodium or no sodium options. Um, and I've found a lot more of those in my local grocer lately than I have in the last five years. So that's really good news uh, for people who are trying to eat more healthfully. We have a lot more options than, than we did previously. Um, Bob, or Rob is asking how, best ways to lower cholesterol. We had actually talked about that previously. Uh, one of the ways is to exercise because exercise can increase the good cholesterol and decrease the bad cholesterol and to uh, avoid saturated fats and look for more poly and monounsaturated fats, things like olive oil, canola oil, avocado oil, um, and uh, fiber because some forms of fiber can actually help remove cholesterol from your bloodstream. So that's just a little bit of a, uh, a wrap up of that is Weight Watchers a good diet. And uh, there have been studies done. And the answer to that is yes. Uh, those uh, Weight Watchers performs similarly to individuals who are on a calorie restriction. So you will lose about the same amount of weight as someone was counting their calories or they're counting points uh, with Weight Watchers. Uh, it's, a, it's pretty much the same thing. So those are, uh, so Weight Watchers, uh, I do actually recommend Weight Watchers. I, you know, I don't recommend a lot of fad diets as we've been talking about previously, but I don't feel that Weight Watchers is a fad diet. It does not cut out entire food groups. It lets you eat uh, real food, regular food. Uh, you don't have to buy special food. Uh, they don't mail it to your door or whatever. You have to go to the grocery store. You have to learn how to purchase healthy things. Um, and it absolutely incentivizes you to choose foods that are higher in fiber and water content like vegetables because they have less points in them. So um, 
I do recommend that. Uh, any of my other panelists, how do you feel about Weight Watchers? I agree. Yeah. I, you know, Weight Watchers is based off of the volumetrics diet, where you know eating more Volumetric. food than a bigger quantity, but with you know less uh, less poor nutrition options, right? So like the idea of taking a, a cup of grapes or you know ten raisins, right? A cup of grapes is going to be more filling than you know a handful of raisins will be. So, you know, the idea that in the grapes, there's also the water and the fiber, right? But the raisins are a very concentrated source of sugar. You can have both on Weight Watchers, but you can eat more grapes than you can raisins. So the idea right. of eating bigger quantities of volume, getting full off of that. Right, right. And I, I try to think of, you know, I, I like to use the example of an apple, a, a sort of small or medium-sized apple is about 50 calories. So, if you're going to, let's say you're going to drink a regular can, 12 ounce can of a sugar sweetened soda, um, that's about 150 calories. That's five apples or whatever. What, right? One, two, three, four, six apples. Who can eat six apples in a sitting? I, I don't think I can. I'd be full, right? Because there's water and there's fiber in apples. So you can eat, you can have that one can of soda and then feel hungry. A half an hour later or you can eat six apples <laughs> over a period of time and you'll feel full you're not going to feel hungry again um and that's uh tamara was talking about volumetrics that's the idea of eating foods that are high in water high in fiber low in calories high in vitamins and minerals and we can all think of what those are fruits and vegetables right eating lots of those things are going to help you feel full longer and, and can sometimes help with calorie restriction um, does food sensitivity to certain foods increase with age? My tolerance for broccoli is minimal lately. So it depends on what you are not tolerating in the broccoli. Um, I would need more information on that, but I don't think food sensitivity will, I think that it can change over time, but I don't think it necessarily increases with age. Does anybody want to weigh in on that? On that? I can say that it does, sensitivities to food can definitely, can definitely change okay. over time. I don't know mm -hmm. that it's due necessarily to age, although mm -hmm. certain things in our bodies, as we age, we do break down things differently, um, okay. and, you know, and our, our ability to do that uh, does, um, like, I, I hear a lot that um, folks say that they become lactose intolerant as they get yes. older, because their ability to break down that protein is, is a little bit harder as we age. So I don't know the ins and outs of exactly why that, why that happens. Maybe Jalisa or Tamar does, but I do know that food sensitivities can change over time, depending on what's mm -hmm. going on. Stress levels have a lot to do with food sensitivities as well. So depending on what's going on in your life there, sometimes we may think that we're sensitive to one thing, but we're actually sensitive to something else. Like it could be as minimal as garlic or onions. So if that broccoli was cooked with garlic or and onions, you may not be sensitive to the broccoli. You may be sensitive to the garlic and onions, just not realizing it. Um, folks can have all sorts of food sensitivities to even things that you wouldn't think of like, um, maple syrup or blueberries or um, all sorts of things. So it's important to really um, not just eliminate a whole food because you think that you may be sensitive. You can talk to your doctor about doing some testing. Um, a lot of doctors will test for those things. Right, right. And I, I think I was thinking more of like food allergies, which is definitely different than a sensitivity. Yes. Um, but you're, you're right, Alyssa, that um, food so especially lactose intolerance becomes more prevalent as we get older because uh, the body stops making the enzymes that are used to break down the, actually the carbohydrates and the sugars that are in milk. Mm -hmm. um, so that is definitely something that happens. Um, but uh, individuals who, uh, you know, for broccoli, if I would need to, is it, is it raw broccoli you're eating or cooked? Sometimes if you cook it, and especially, uh, I know we talked about not making it mushy. For some people, making it mushy is the only way they're going to be able to eat it. And I'm all for that, right? If you have to cook it so much that it, it really falls apart. And personally, with broccoli, I sort of like it that way. That's just the way that I like it. Um, but uh, that's okay. Because I'd rather have you eat the broccoli, even though it's sort of mushy, than not eat the broccoli. Um, but uh, certainly, raw broccoli, people can be more sensitive to that. Uh, than uh, 
then cooked broccoli. And, you know, if broccoli is the only thing that you really are very sensitive to, there are so many other vegetables out there, right? Try all different kinds. Bro broccoli is in the um, uh, uh, category of foods called cruciferous vegetables. So things like cabbage, um, cauliflower, uh, onions, garlic, they all are in that category and they all have this very similar health benefits. So if you don't tolerate broccoli, maybe you can tolerate one of those other types of vegetables. Um, what are good calcium sources for people who are lactose intolerant? Who would like to answer that? Dark leafy greens. Collards. <laughs> yeah, collards, <laughs> kale, mustard greens, right. all great sources of calcium plant-based. Soy, a lot of soy products are fortified with calcium soy. also. Yep, yep. Right, so um, I know that uh, there are a lot of milk alternatives out there, um, but so fortified soy beverages are the closest in nutrient content to cow's milk. So even though there's almond milk out there and rice milk, they don't have the protein in them that soy does. So soy, fortified soy, soy beverages that are fortified with calcium come the closest to the nutrient content of cow's milk. So that's the one that we uh, try to uh, recommend the most to individuals who are lactose intolerant. You can do those um, leafy green vegetables. They have calcium in them as well, but that Calcium is not as bioavailable as the calcium that is in some other, so at, that would be in uh, fortified soy milk. So that is just something to keep in mind. Uh, lactate milk is also always a good option. Say that again. Lactate mm -hmm. milk. Yep. Or that. Or lactate yep. pills. Yep. Lactate pills. And I, I think they even make like a, a, a frozen dessert type of thing mm -hmm. as well. So that's also a great choice. I think that there are a lot more options out there for people who uh, have lactose sensitivity. Uh, and we only have a few more minutes left, so I'm gonna take a couple more questions. Uh, what's your opinion on gut health? Um, there, I, I'll, I can start and kick us off. <laughs> There's a yep. lot of research uh, lately on gut health. It's really a hot ticket, a hot topic item in the world of nutrition. <laughs> <clears throat> and there's a lot of research that is starting to show that our immune system starts with our gut. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to maintain a healthy gut for our immune system. So um, that's just something something to keep in mind to keep a healthy mm -hmm. gut. Mm -hmm. What are some foods you'd recommend for a healthy gut? Uh, probiotics. So you may hear, you know, um, yogurt, for example, has a lot of probiotics, which also helps uh, helps with gut health. Some fermented foods, sauerkraut, yes. kimchi, yep. anyone likes, you know, a little spice. Kimchi, yep, absolutely. And the reason fermented foods are good is because they have probiotics or they have prebiotics. Is it prebiotics that they oh, have? Fiber no. is a prebiotic. The prebiotic. It's a probiotic, right? The fermented foods have probiotics. The prebiotics yes. are like fiber. onions, garlic. Right, so those okay. prebiotics also, you know, help provide a lot of food for our bacteria in our gut and they help keep them healthy and happy. Right. So, you know, probiotics, you're adding more live bacteria to our bacteria. So like friends, but the prebiotics <laughs> are how we feed them. So, you know, you can have as many friends, but if everyone's hungry, it's not so fun. Right, right. <laughs> yep. And, and yogurt is a great way to do that. If you like yogurt, one of the things that you can do is uh, first you want to look for a yogurt that has as little sugar as possible. Um, there are some sort of drinkable yogurt types of things that are called kefir. That's also a fermented dairy product. Some of those products like uh, the kefir and the yogurt are well tolerated by people who are lactose intolerant because they tend to have less lactose in them. So the bacteria that live in the yogurt and the kefir actually break down some of that lactose. So uh, many people who are lactose intolerant find that they're able to have small portions, maybe, you know, you're not going to eat, you know, two gallons of it at once, but small portions of those fermented foods um, at a time so that you can get some of those probiotics in your gut. And it is something that you need to replace, you know, at least several times a week, if not every day, because our GI system, things are moving through and things come in and then things go out. And so some of those probiotics will move out, uh, with the normal process of every day. And uh, we need to replenish those every day. 
Um, Something that's really cool with the fermented products is you'll notice, and this is totally normal, um, and you want it to look this way, is when you open the jar, you'll see like um, yes. of the cabbage, for example, you'll or like the sauerkraut, um, the ones that have a lot of probiotics in them, you'll see when you open the jar, it kind of fizzes at the top, and that's yes. sort of like all the probiotics, <laughs> probiotics in there, so that's a good They're thing. Working. Yep. Um, they're working. So that's something you want to look for if you're choosing fermentable foods. Right, right. And I'm going to take one more question, which is what about the keto diet? We've got about one minute left here. So the keto diet actually started as an epilepsy diet for people with epilepsy. Um, also specifically in children. Now we see how effective it is. It was never meant to be a long-term diet and it was really meant to help prevent seizures uh, it was not meant for the general population. Um, it caught on now as a fast fad for weight loss. I don't recommend it personally because again, like we talked about fad diets, anytime you cut out an entire food group or like really restrict a food group, you end up putting like butter in your coffee, right? right. You, uh, you do things that are not particularly sustainable in the long run. Right. So I personally do not recommend it unless you are a child with epilepsy. Right, right, right. So it was a, it was a medical um, thing that sort of went into the general population. But thank you. Thanks so much, guys, for joining me today. You guys have been wonderful. I really do appreciate all of your time. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing here on the NYSOFA Facebook page on Friday, January 22nd at 1130. Right here, I am going to be doing my first installment of What's Cooking with Wendy. I'm going to be preparing a rice bowl Southwestern style. So I'm going to be doing a little bit of a cooking demo. And our next Ask the Expert Nutrition Edition will be taking place on 1 o'clock on Friday, February 5th, which is also Wear Red Day for Heart Health Awareness Month. Molly Capito, the registered dietitian and nutrition educator for the Montgomery County Office for the Aging, is going to be joining me on that date. So thanks so much, guys, for joining me, and we will see you next month. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.